I might get COVID. I might die. For me to sit back and not do this is not being a faithful follower of Christ. Today, I'm in conversation with Michael Schuberg, the executive director for the Five Oaks Education and Retreat Center. Nestled just outside of Paris, Ontario, the center welcomes spiritual seekers of all faiths to live, work, pray, heal, and act for justice together. When COVID-19 hit in March of 2020, their programming came to an abrupt and painful halt. And at that same time, migrants, seasonal workers who travel from other countries to pick produce on Ontario farms and support their families back home, were making their yearly trek north. There have always been systemic justice issues around seasonal workers, but this year, the Canadian government was requiring a two-week self-isolation stay for every newly arrived traveler to Canada and safe, socially distant living quarters, something many advocates say was not possible on most farms where bunkhouses with beds less than six feet apart are the norm. In 2020, the Fifth Estate did an expose called Bitter Harvest about the price paid by Ontario's migrant workers who were putting food on Canadian tables during the pandemic. Among other things, they found that the migrant workers were 10 times more likely to contract COVID than the average population. For Michael and the Five Oaks team, Sweetening some of the bitterness was a calling from God that led them to provide nearly 300 workers with 14-day isolation care and 47 migrants with long-term stays. Michael Schubert, thanks for taking time to share your pandemic story with our listeners. Well, Five Oaks is a place, you know, as you mentioned, that people come to pray, to play, to heal, to be together, and... This is rooted in the inner and outer work that we offer, what I would refer to in a pandemic time as our regular guests. You know, since the 1950s, Five Oaks has welcomed people to this sacred land to do that work. And when the pandemic began, we were devastated to know that we would likely have to shutter the center for an indefinite amount of time. So I know in my own life and when i've 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 talked to people even on this podcast um when you're looking back at your journey you can see stories moments in time that led you to be exactly where you are today and i wondered if you could share one story or a moment in time that comes to mind that has led you to be the ED at Five Oaks and host nearly five, 300 migrants. You know, as a teenager, I worked on a farm. I worked on a farm for seven summers, picking tomatoes and broccoli and Spanish onions and harvesting tobacco. I know how hard that work is. I know how tired you are at the end of the day. And while I'm not a migrant worker, I, I can identify with the work of the agricultural industry. My partner is a farmer to this day and I live on a farm. So, so I get it. It's in our blood and it's in our DNA. I think the other piece that, you know, highlights for me, what we're doing is my work as a United Church camp director in the formation of the Go Project, which was a ministry at Islington United Church. All opportunities where people come together to be in a space together and to be in community. And I think these two pieces of my life kind of merge together in this pandemic time to, to care for these men and women and to, to make it comfortable, to make it intentional and to recognize the sacrifice that they're making. I, I think my, my story has given me empathy for what they're doing here and what they're doing for for the agricultural sector. So you're a farming family, you're the executive director at a retreat center, and COVID-19 hits and the programming dries up and some sacrifices have to be made. That must have been devastating for the staff. 
you know, I made my plan sort of thinking if we can make it to Victoria Day weekend, you know, it would all be over by then and we get back to work. And so we did lay off a number of staff. We lost, you know, within a week, half a year's worth of bookings. It was unbelievable. And devastating is a good word to describe how that felt. You know, Five Oaks rebounded four years ago with a new vision as an intercultural interfaith retreat center. And to have all of that washed away and in a flood of a pandemic, I just remember standing by the river here and praying and wondering and being a bit mad to be honest. So in the middle of this drastic shift from a a powerful ministry of presence with people who need retreats and the middle of the shift of this world that's plummeting into lockdown and isolation, you found a way to be proactive. You reached out to the government officials, right? What did you say? Well, actually, it's a, it was a website, so you could just type in your idea. So some people were typing in, I can make hand sanitizer, and other people were writing in saying, we can make face shields. Or I heard Canada Goose in Manitoba, the, the coat company, shifted to make you know gowns. And so we imagined becoming an isolation center for infected healthcare workers, and that this could be a place where they come to heal and recover. And it was the County of Brant who reached out to us having heard this idea and suggested housing migrant workers. So I have to admit it wasn't my brilliant idea, but it was one that we got excited about immediately and uh, got to work on right away. And the pandemic basically happened and delayed all of these workers' arrivals. And so some farms had very little to no harvesters uh, for early crops. And and one of them was an asparagus farmer. And he basically lost his entire crop. I I heard it was $800,000 of asparagus rotted in his field. And and these are the kind of issues that, you know, farm owners were facing, you know. Didn't he reach out to local, um, local people to, to see if they could help? I I think there was something you'd mentioned about that. Yeah, he did. The farm owner actually offered a, a very reasonable, hourly wage uh, to folks that wanted to come and harvest uh, asparagus in a small cohort. And some people showed up, but it was nowhere near what they needed to to harvest this crop. And most people, you know, couldn't hack it out for more than a couple days. Um, it is backbreaking, long days, hard work um, that these workers do on behalf of farm owners and on behalf of each of us that eat. Um, yeah, we, we scrambled, we worked really, really hard to be honest, those few weeks at the beginning of April were some of the hardest days that I've ever worked in my entire career. Um, but our staff really pulled together and it's important to note that many of our staff had been laid off. So they were being called back to work after having been, having been laid off unexpectedly, nervously coming back to work, you know, all of a sudden you know, going from working at a safe retreat center to housing people that could have COVID and were afraid. And, you know, the team here really stepped up and um, I'm very proud of them. You know, they, they've done a remarkable job. I can hear that. I can hear that. And so first you're providing these 14 day isolation stays for people who, as you said, may or may not uh, have stepped off a plane with COVID Um, And then you moved into another sort of ministry later in the summer. Yeah, as farms, you know, some of the farms we work with, they have up to 500 migrant workers working on site. So you can imagine they have housing made available for for 500 workers according to the, you know, rules that the federal government has. And now in the pandemic are required to keep people six feet apart in bunkhouses. So you know, six feet apart would have two bunk beds in it. So all of a sudden a space that housed four workers for overnight now can have one. So they were scrambling to find spots to have all their workers, their workforce, you know, safely housed and approached us to ask if we would do what we're, what we would call commuter care, where the workers would live on site um, in our accommodations, get up in the morning on a bus, go to the farm and then come back in the evening and then do that every day, back and forth, um, back and forth. And so we 
we again shifted space that had been created to house people in small groups to house folks safely six feet apart. And from August 1st until Thanksgiving, we housed 47 workers in this way. So um, it's it was a beautiful opportunity to get to know some of those workers a little more. Um, they had been through quarantine and were able to be a little bit more social with them and get to enjoy in knowing them a little bit better. Where were these workers coming from? Yeah, so we housed workers um, mainly from Mexico, um, but also housed workers from Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica. But the majority of our workers were Mexican. Did that mean that there were language barriers that you overcome? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Google Translate, it was an app that was well used on my phone uh, this past year. And I don't speak a lot of Spanish, but did start to learn uh, a little bit here and there. And as we move into the 2021 housing season, one of our plans is to hire a Spanish speaking staff member that uh, can help us with this program this summer. When you think about that first cohort that came to live with you last year, are there stories or individuals that are moments in the cross-cultural, cross-language situation that really stand out for you? Well, one moment that really stood out for me, you know, April 17th was the, the arrival of our first group. And uh, we had transformed the space, you know, to welcome folks. And it snowed that day. And uh, I couldn't believe it. You know, we had worked so hard and here we were welcoming this group of Mexican men to the property and snow was falling. And I just, it was so surreal. I just thought, come on, 2020, how is this possible? <laughs> and 2020 offered so much more since then. But that is one thing that stands out for me. I'm not sure it's a beautiful moment, but it's a meaningful moment. Uh, one of our workers, um, he had just arrived and been in quarantine for three days. And he found out from his partner back home that their child had contracted COVID. And he was obviously, as any parent would be, totally afraid. And in quarantine in Canada, far, far away. And he needed to go, he wanted to go home. And so just working with him through a language barrier to figure that out, um, getting a suitcase and packing it full of clothes to take home and just, just, being with him, you know, like I'm a pastor, <laughs> it's my job. It's one of the things I've always done. And just to pray with him, it threw a language barrier to be present together through masked and being apart. It was just when you just want to hug him, you know? I was thinking that um, the country of Mexico is is known for its uh, Catholicism and, and people, a lot of people still practice uh, their faith. Did that play a part in the relationship to being at a retreat center and being at Five Oaks? Yeah, of course. We didn't want to make any assumptions about people's spiritual journey or faith background, but, yeah. um, you know, there's a couple of special moments. One of them was the Baha'i community in Brantford reached out to us and they asked if they could prepare a prayer card for the Spanish speaking uh, workers. So they did that and they delivered them. And I know it was very meaningful to many workers to have that prayer and that card to read. Another really special moment was actually with one of our Jamaican workers. He found out that I was a pastor somehow and and uh, he talked with me a lot. His his outdoor quarantine zone was outside of, right outside of our front office. And so, you know, every day he would talk to me and he asked for a devotional and just an opportunity to to talk a little bit about faith and his family and his background. And uh, yeah, there were some very special moments like that where we got to see the humane, the human side of, of, of these guests. It sounds like you were learning how to show empathy through a mask. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that would be a good title. Empathy through a mask. I also imagine that for many of the laborers, this might have been their first time they ever stayed at a retreat center before. What was the response of the guests to being at Five Oaks? So, yeah, for some of these workers, to be honest, it was their first time leaving their home country. It was their first time signing up for a migrant care worker program. For some, it was their first time leaving their parents' house. You know, young men 
coming to Canada to, to earn money to take home and to come here was a nerve wracking experience. But I know that many of the workers had an opportunity once they got to the farm to chat with workers who had been housed perhaps in a hotel and to be able to then share their experience back to us about how grateful they were to be in a space that was quiet in a rural location in nature. Um, I don't know. It feels like I'm bragging, but we were, got a lot of feedback from not only farm owners and farm workers, but even from the public health unit that what we're offering here at Five Oaks was a stellar experience, one that really cared for people in a, an intentional way. The migrant worker program saved Five Oaks. It's the reason we're still open. It's the reason that it's going to be here for my son to enjoy in a year or five years. It's the reason that Muslim and Indigenous and Christian and spiritual seekers can have a place. And I'm, I'm, I have to admit that I'm surprised that it was a migrant worker program that turned it around. I mean, this, we, we still did not have the year we planned for, mm -hmm. but we're here and we're going to do it again in 2021. And it was probably one of the most meaningful things I've done in my life. Um, and I'm wondering if it was for your neighbors as well, or did you face any opposition to housing migrants who may or may not, as you said, have, have brought COVID? I remember having a conversation with a friend when we first started this work and saying, I might get COVID, I might die. Like, but yeah. also really feeling called to do the work, like to, for me to sit back and not do this is not being a faithful follower of Christ. And I, it was just the right thing to do. And I, I think lots of other people would have done it. We have two lovely neighbors that live next to Five Oaks here. Um, they're our closest neighbors. They live in a house just on the same road as us. And they're, they're both police officers and really watch out for Five Oaks. And they made signs for their front yard. And I can't tell you what it said in Spanish, but it basically said, um, welcome to Canada. May God bless you. And when the buses came in, the workers could see these signs and they didn't ask to do that. They put them on their own lawn, you know, just to walk them. It was so beautiful. Um, people wanted to give back, you know, our neighboring United Church, Bethel Stone United Church, they called and they said they wanted to make care packages for these workers. So they made like over 200 care packages with like shampoo and shaving cream and snacks and every worker got one. You know, people asked if they could donate clothing. And so we put a call out and literally truckloads of clothing came to be sorted and, and for the workers to, to use or to take home to their kids. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're really, uh, one last thing is when we, when we shared this on our social media, uh, that, the first arrival, we got 40,000 hits on Facebook, like Amazing. You know, 200 hits normally. So you know, people really cared. It was shared 500 times. Um, this is what I, I find, you know, so inspiring and part of the hope of the podcast, right, is contagious hope because nothing spreads like love. Hmm. And I'm hearing this beautiful echo of Matthew 25, when I was a migrant, you welcomed me, you fed me. You housed me, you clothed me, and in that you found your life. Five Oaks is alive today because of answering the call of the stranger in need. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's so true. And I know that you're about to do that again. We are, you know, on in the, in the middle of the second wave of COVID-19 and under a new stay-at-home order, the vaccine is still months away from being available. And you're preparing to do this again. I, I wonder how you're feeling about that. Oh, I'm feeling lots of things. 
first of all, you know, frustrated like everyone else that we're, we're still in this. And that's not just me. I'm sure the migrant workers are thinking, oh my gosh, I have to go and quarantine again. You know, I have to do that again. Um, it's It affects us all. But, you know, we're starting this feeling really prepared. We had a chance to evaluate and learn from our experience last year. And I think we're going to be able to offer an even better experience. You know, we want to hire a Spanish speaking uh, summer student to check in on our workers every day. We want to make sure we have uh, Spanish novels on hand or, you know, Spanish movies, um, things that people can do. We want to have coloring books and markers and we want to make sure that people's time on a unique retreat is, is good and healing and whole. We want to cook more culturally appropriate food. Like there's so many things and it's exciting. Our staff are really excited to do it. And yeah, we're, we're going to house even more workers this year. You know, we're planning for 350 to 400 workers in short-term isolation care and uh, almost 90 workers in the long-term stay. So that's amazing, Michael. Yeah. And I'm thinking about the, the listeners that are hearing this story and will be hearing this in the middle of Lent, uh, still a f quite a few weeks away from when you will welcome your first guests. Um, most of the listeners are people of faith from the Shining Waters region of the United Church of Canada. Um, and the congregants listening are going to be diverse. So I'm just wondering if you were able to reach out through the microphone and speak to those of us that are listening that are government officials and religious leaders and laity, what would you identify as the need? What ask would you make on behalf of those that you served last year and the people that you are getting ready to host again this year? I think my biggest ask or my prayer is that we each take time to learn about the complexity that exists in this system. It's, it's a system that each one of us is a part of. We go to the grocery store and we choose an Ontario apple. We're a part of the system. Right. And as a consumer, we have a voice and the system goes all the way through from farm owners to seasonal workers to federal policy. And it's easy to look at only one aspect of the story, but we need to understand that it's a system that needs to be changed. And it starts with how much we're willing to pay for that apple. It's as simple as that. If you want cheap broccoli, then this is the system that needs to have be in place to keep food cheap. And if we care, then we have to ch change the way we buy. Mm -hmm. To think that we're not a part of the system is ignorant and that's blunt, but mm -hmm. we all eat. Mm -hmm. And these are people that are coming and leaving their families and coming to earn an income to support them when they go home. And it's a complex, complex thing just like everything in life is. You've been given this incredible opportunity, though knowing you as I do, you've always been able to see this, but you've been given yet another opportunity to see strangers as siblings, mm -hmm. as human beings worthy of dignity and love and meaningful work and just reward. Yeah. Actually, it's funny that you say that. I have, um, for a couple of years now, a sticky note stuck on my wall since before the pandemic. That's really relevant to the work we do here at Five Oaks as a retreat center. And the sticky note says, no one is just passing through. And that's true of the migrant worker program we did as well. You know, no one is just passing through. We have an opportunity to be in relationship, to be connected uh to each other to nature to creator and that's what we hope to do here at five oaks and it sounds like 
no matter how many years this migrant program goes on at Five Oaks, that the people that have passed through in literal ways have somehow managed to make permanent homes in your heart. I wonder if you even know yet or could articulate how you've been changed by this last year. I'm, 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 I was blessed to be able to be a part of offering housing and care for these men and women. Um, it gave me something to do that was meaningful in a time when many of us had to, to stay home. I felt that really strongly in the second wave when we didn't have workers here and, you know, our regular work also wasn't happening. It, it, it was, it was like a rudder for me in, in the pandemic time. Does your work set a higher standard for others in the food system, the farmers um, and others who are working with our migrant population? Do you think that Five Oaks has a role to play in inspiring, encouraging others to live up to a higher standard when it comes to our brothers and sisters and siblings who are coming from different countries to work our fields? I believe that we offered safe and comfortable housing for workers in a, in a time that no one expected. And obviously we're going to do that again in 2021. I would say that, you know, if I could look forward five years from now, I would say that I, I could see Five Oaks hosting a, a round table event with owners of farms and advocates for migrant workers and migrant workers as a place to continue what started here last year, a safe place where maybe resolution can come to the future of a migrant worker program. Um, so I think there's lots of opportunities to support this system that are still coming to fruition. Michael, I add my prayers to yours for a future that is safer and more just for every one of the members that take part in the system too. And to the listener, thank you for taking in Michael's stories. Michael reminds us that we are not simply passing through one another's lives. This podcast, Contagious Hope, explores the way love has spread over the last year. As we move through the second wave of this pandemic, I hope this podcast has you wondering, how will I boldly, creatively, lovingly answer the call to be at the side of my neighbor today? For there is no lockdown on love, no quarantine on God's grace. This is Alexa Gilmore, and I'm sharing these stories as a way of inviting you, the faithful, to the front lines, the back alleys, the lonely rooms, the migrant fields, and every place where Christ is found. Contagious Hope is produced by Rev. Alexa Gilmore with assistance from the McGeechee Senior Scholarship, administered by the United Church of Canada. Special thanks to our guests and our editor, Peter Restivo. To share your feedback and join in the conversation, email gilmorealexa at gmail.com. That's G-I-L-M-O-U-R Alexa at gmail.com. <laughs>